welcome to the chamber work. My brother, the second section of this degree is principally devoted to the explanation of physical science and by the studies attached thereto, the mind is improved and elevated to a communion with its maker. Circumstances of importance to the craft and of peculiar interest to the mason who delights in the study of the mystic beauties of his profession are here developed and explained. The second section of this degree also holds reference to the origin of the institution and views masonry under two denominations, operative and speculative. By operative masonry, we allude to the proper application of the useful rules of architecture, whence a structure will derive figure, strength, and beauty, and whence will result a due proportion and just correspondence in all its parts. It furnishes us with dwellings and convenient shelter from the vicissitudes and inclemencies of seasons. And while it displays the effects of human wisdom, as well in the choice as in the arrangement of the sundry materials of which an edifice is composed, it demonstrates that a fund of science and industry is implanted in man for the best, most solitary and beneficent purposes by speculative or free masonry we learn to subdue the passions act upon the square keep a tongue of good report maintain secrecy and practice charity it is so far interwoven with religion as to lay us under obligation to pay that rational homage to the deity which at once constitutes our duty and our happiness. It leads the contemplative to view with reverence and admiration the glorious works of creation and inspires him with the most exalted ideas of the perfection of his divine creator. The second section of this degree also refers to the origin of the Jewish Sabbath as well as the manner in which it was kept by our ancient brethren. In six days, God created the heaven and the earth and rested on the seventh day. The seventh, therefore, our ancient brethren consecrated as a day of rest from their labor, thereby enjoying frequent opportunities to contemplate the glorious works of creation and to adore the great creator. At the building of King Solomon's temple, there were 80,000 fellow crafts employed. These were all under the immediate direction of our ancient operative, Grand Master Hiram Abiff. On the evening of the sixth day, their work was inspected and all who had proved themselves worthy by strict fidelity to their duties were invested with certain mystic signs, grips, and words to enable them to gain admission into the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple. On the same day and hour, King Solomon, accompanied by his confidential officers consisting of his secretary, junior, and senior wardens repaired to the middle chamber to meet them. His secretary, he placed near his person, the senior warden at the inner and the junior warden at the outer door, giving them strict instructions to suffer none to enter except such as were in possession of certain mystic signs, grips, and words previously established so that when any did enter, he, knowing that they must have been faithful workmen or they could not have gained admission, had nothing to do but order their names recorded as such and pay them their wages, which they received in corn, wine, and oil. 
emblematical of nourishment, refreshment, and joy. And after solemnly admonishing them of their reverence do the great and sacred name of deity, suffered them to depart in peace until the time should arrive to commence the following week's work. This, you will perceive, was all accomplished on the evening of the sixth day, that there might be no unnecessary labor performed on the seventh, that being a day set apart for rest and meditation. We, my brother, are in possession of the same mystic signs, grips, and words as were our ancient brethren and are about to endeavor to work our way into a place representing the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple. And we should succeed, I have no doubt, we shall be alike received and rewarded. In doing this, it will be necessary for us to make an advance emblematically through a porch, up a flight of winding stairs, consisting of three, five, and seven steps through an outer and inner door. In making this advance, we necessarily pass between two pillars or columns, representing those pillars erected at the entrance to the porch of King Solomon's temple. One on the right hand, the other on the left. The name of the one on the left hand was Boaz, denoting strength. The name of the one on the right, Jachin, denoting establishment, collectively alluding to several promises of God to David, one of which reads, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Also, he made before the house two pillars of thirty and five cubits high, and the chapter that was on the top of each of them was five cubits. Their composition was of molten or cast brass, the better to withstand inundation or conflagration, that they might not be removed by flood or destroyed by fire. They were cast in the clay grounds on the banks of the River Jordan between Sukkot and Zeradatha, where King Solomon ordered these and all the sacred vessels of the temple to be cast. They were cast hollow for the purpose of containing the rolls and records which composed the archives of our ancient brethren. Their chapters were adorned with leaves of lily work network and chains of pomegranates denoting peace, unity, and plenty. The lily, from its extreme whiteness as well as the retired situation in which it grows, denotes peace. The network, from the intimate connection of all its parts, unity, and the pomegranate, from the exuberance of its seed denotes plenty. These pillars are surmounted by two artificial spherical bodies on the convex surfaces of which are represented the countries, seas, and various parts of the earth. The face of the heavens, the planetary revolutions, and other important particulars. Contemplating these bodies, we are inspired with a due reverence for the deity and his works and are induced to encourage the studies of astronomy, geography, navigation, and the arts dependent on them by which society has been so much benefited. Passing between these columns, the next object to which our attention is particularly drawn is a representation of a flight of winding stairs consisting of three, five, and seven steps, each of which has certain Masonic significance. The 
Three Step Salute to the three great lights in masonry, the Holy Bible, Square, and Compasses. Also, to the three principal officers of the Lodge, the Worshipful Master, Senior, and Junior Wardens, who represent the three great supports of masonry, wisdom, strength, and beauty. It being necessary that there should be wisdom to contrive, strength to support, and beauty to adorn all great and important undertakings. The three steps also allude to the great luminary of creation as he appears to us at the three principal points of observation. He rises in the east to open the day with a mild and gentle influence and all nature rejoices at the appearance of his beams. He gains his meridian in the south invigorating all things with the perfection of his ripening qualities. With declining strength, he sets in the west to close the day, leaving mankind to rest from their labor. This is the type of the three principal stages in the life of man, infancy, manhood, and age. The first of these is characterized by the blush of innocence as pure as the tents that guile the eastern porters of the day. And the heart rejoices in the unsuspecting integrity of its own unblemished virtue, nor fears deceit because it knows no God. Manhood succeeds. The ripening intellect attains the meridian of its powers. At the approach of old age, strength decays. His sun is setting in the west. Enfeebled by sickness and bodily infirmities, he lingers on until death finally closes his eventful day. And happy is he if the setting splendors of a virtuous life guard his departing moments with the gentle tints of hope and close his short career in peace, harmony, and brotherly love. Ponder well, my brother, upon the wisdom taught by these emblems and be admonished that when thy summon comes to join the innumerable caravan which moves to that mysterious realm where each shall take his chamber in the silent halls of death. Thou go not, like the quarry slave at night, scourged to his dungeon, but sustained and soothed. By an unfaltering trust, approach thy grave like one who wraps the drapery of his couch about him and lies down to pleasant dreams. We will make a further advance and ascend the five steps. The five steps allude to the five orders of architecture and the five human senses. By order in architecture is meant a system of all the members, proportions, and ornaments of columns, pilasters, or it is the regular arrangement of the projecting parts of a building which united with those of a column form a beautiful, perfect, and complete whole. First, the formation of society. Order in architecture may be traced. When the rigors of seasons oblige men to contrive shelter from the inclemency of the weather, we learn that they first planted trees on end and then laid others across to support a covering. The bands which connected those trees at top and bottom are said to have given rise to the idea of the base and capital of pillars. And from this simple hint, originally proceeded the more improved art of architecture. The five orders are thus classified. The Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, and Composite. 
the ancient and original orders of architecture revered by masons are no more than three the doric ionic and corinthian which were invented by the greeks to these the romans have added two the tuscan which they made plainer than the doric and the composite which was more ornamental, if not more beautiful, than the Corinthian. The first three orders alone, however, show invention and particular character and essentially differ from each other. The two others, having nothing but what is borrowed and differ only accidentally. The Tuscan is the Doric in its earliest state and the composite is the Corinthian enriched with the Ionic. To the Greeks, therefore, and not to the Romans, we are indebted for that which is great, judicious, and distinct in architecture. The five human senses are hearing, seeing, feeling, smelling, and tasting. The first three of which have ever been deemed prerequisite to being made a mason. For by hearing, we hear the word, shibboleth. By seeing, we see the sign. And by feeling, we feel that friendly and brotherly grip whereby one mason may know another in the dark as in the light. We will now make a still further advance and ascend the seven steps. The seven steps allude to the seven liberal arts and sciences, which are grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Grammar is a science which teaches us how to express our ideas in appropriate words, which we afterward beautify and adorn with rhetoric, while logic instructs us how to think and reason with propriety and to make language subordinate to thought. Arithmetic, which is the science of computing by numbers, is absolutely essential not only to a thorough knowledge of all mathematical science, but also to a proper pursuit of our daily vocations. Geometry treats of the powers and properties of magnitudes in general, where length, breadth, and thickness are considered from a point to a line from a line to a superficies, and from a superficies to a solid. A point is the beginning of all geometrical matter. A line is the continuation of the same. A superficies has length and breadth without a given thickness. A solid has length and breadth with a given thickness, which forms a cube and comprehends the whole. By this science, the architect is enabled to construct his plans and execute his designs. The general to arrange his soldiers, the engineer to mark out grounds for encampments, the geographer to give the dimensions of the world and all things therein contained to delineate the extent of the seas and specify the divisions of empires, kingdoms, and provinces. By it also, the astronomer is enabled to make his observations and to fix the duration of times and seasons, years, and cycles. In fine, geometry is the foundation of architecture and the root of mathematics. To be without a perception of the charms of music is to be without the finer traits of humanity. It is the medium which gives the natural world communication with the spiritual, and few are they who have not felt its power and acknowledge its expressions 
to be intelligible to the heart. It is a language of delightful sensations, far more eloquent than words. It breathes to the ear the clearest intimations. It touches and gently agitates the agreeable and sublime passions. It wraps us in melancholy and elevates us to joy. It dissolves and inflames. It melts us in tenderness and excites us to war. It has a voice for every age and a capacity for every degree of taste and intelligence. Its lullaby soothes the infant in its mother's arms. Its joyous notes wing the tripping feet of the dancers on the green. Its martial tones inspire the spirit of patriotism, nerve the warrior's arm, and fire his heart. The stirring strains of national airs, heard on the rough edge of battle, have ever thrilled the soldier, causing him to burn with an immolous desire to lead the perilous advance and animating him to deeds of heroic valor and the most sublime devotion. Amid the roar of cannon, the dean of Market Street and the carnage of battle, he is stricken to the dust, raising himself to take one last long look on life. He hears in the distance that plaintive strain, home, sweet home. It was our mother's evening hymn and has often lulled us to sleep in infancy, the mellowing tides of old cathedral airs vibrating through aisles and arches have stilled the ruffled spirit and sweeping aside the discordant passions of men have borne them along its resistless current until their united voices have joined and sounding aloud the chorus of the heaven-born anthem peace on earth good will toward men. But music never sounds with such seraphic harmony as when employed in singing hymns of gratitude to the creator of the universe. Be thou, O God, exalted high, and as thy glory fills the sky, so let it be on earth displayed till thou art here as there obey astronomy is that sublime science which inspires the contemplative mind to soar aloft and read the wisdom strength and beauty of the great creator in the heavens how nobly eloquent of the deity is the celestial hemisphere spangled with the most magnificent heralds of his infinite glory. They speak to the whole universe for there is no people so barbarous as to fail to understand their language, no nation so distant that their voices are not heard among them. My brother, we are now approaching a place representing the outer door to the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple which we will find partly open but closely tied by the junior ward who will doubtless demand of us the password of a fellow crowd. Let us advance and make a regular alarm. Who comes here? Fellow crabs, endeavoring to work their way into a place representing the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple. How do you expect to gain admission? By the password of a fellow crab. Give it. What does it denote? Plenty. How represented by a sheaf of wheat 
suspended near a waterfall, which teaches us that while we have bread to eat and pure refreshing water to drink, we have all that necessity requires. By whom instituted? By Jephthah, a judge of Israel, in a war with the Ephraimites. The Ephraimites had long been a stubborn and rebellious people whom Jephthah had striven to subdue by mild and lenient measures, but without effect. They were highly incensed at Jephthah for not being called to fight and share in the rich spoils of the Ammonitish war and gathered together a mighty army, crossed the river Jordan and prepared to give Jephthah battle. But being apprised of their approach, he called together the men of Israel, went forth, gave them battle, and put them to flight. And to make his victory more complete, he stationed guards at the different passes along the banks of the river Jordan, and said unto them, If ye see any strangers pass this way, say unto them, Now say ye, but the Ephraimites, being of a different tribe, could not frame to pronounce the word and say, This trifling defect proved them to be enemies and cost them their lives. And there fell that day on the field of battle and at the different passes along the banks of the river in Jordan, forty and two thousand. After which, Jephthah ruled quietly in Israel until the time of his death, and all about six years. This was what affected us to distinguish a friend from a foe, and has since been adopted as the password to be given before entering any regular and well-governed lodge of fellow craft. I am satisfied. Pass on. My brothers, we are now approaching a place representing the inner door to the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple, which we will find partly open, but closely tiled by the senior warden, who will doubtless demand of us the real grit and word of a fellow craft. Let us advance and make the alarm. Who comes here? Fellow crabs, endeavoring to work their way into a place representing the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple. How do you expect to gain admission? by the real grip and word of a fellow crab. Advance and give it. What is this? The real grip of a fellow crab. Has it a name? It has. Will you give it to me? I did not so receive it, neither will I so impart it. How will you dispose of it? Letter or half it? Let it and begin. You begin, begin you. I am satisfied. Pass on and in. My brother, we are now in a place representing the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple. Behold the letter G suspended in the east it is the initial of geometry the first and noblest of sciences and the basis of which the superstructure of freemasonry is erected by geometry we may curiously trace nature through her various windings to her most concealed recesses by it we discover the power wisdom and goodness of the grand architect of the universe and view with delight the proportions which compose this vast machine 
By it, we discover how the planets move in their respective orbits and demonstrate their various revolutions. By it, we count for the return of the seasons and the variety of scenes which each season displays to the discerning eye. Numberless worlds are around us, all framed by the same divine artist, which roll through the vast expanse and are all conducted by the same unerring law of nature. A survey of nature and the observations of her beautiful proportions first determined man to imitate the divine plan and study symmetry and order. This gave rise to societies and birth to every useful art. The architect began to design and the plans which he laid down being improved by time and experience have produced works which are the admiration of every age. The lapse of time, the ruthless hand of ignorance and the devastations of war have laid waste and destroyed many valuable monuments of antiquity on which the utmost exertions of human genius have been employed. Even the Temple of Solomon, so spacious and magnificent and constructed by so many celebrated artists, escaped not the unsparing ravages of barbarous force. Freemasonry, notwithstanding, still survives. The attentive ear receives the sound from the instructive tongue and the mysteries of Freemasonry are safely lodged in the repository of faithful breasts. Ages ago, upon the Eastern Plains was our institution set up, founded upon principles more durable than the metal wrought into the statues of ancient kings. Age after age rolled by, storm and tempest hurled their thunders at its head, Wave after wave of bright insidious sands curled about its feet and heaped their sliding grains against its sides. Men came and went in fleeting generations. Seasons fled like hours through the whirling wheel of time. But through the attrition of the waves and sands of life, through evil report as well as good, Freemasonry has maintained its beneficent influence spreading wider and wider over the earth. Tools and implements of architecture and symbolic emblems most expressive have been selected by the fraternity to imprint on the mind wise and serious truths and thus through the succession of ages have been transmitted unimpaired the most excellent tenets of our institution. Every brother admitted within the walls of this middle chamber should heed the lessons here inculcated and consider that as a Freemason, he is a builder, not of a material edifice, but of a temple more glorious than that of Solomon, a temple of honor, of justice, of purity, of knowledge and of truth, and that these tools of the operative mason's art indicate the labors he is to perform, the dangers he is to encounter, and the preparations he is to make in the uprearing of that spiritual temple wherein his soul will find rest forever and forevermore. Then, indeed, will the attentive ear have received the sound from the instructive tongue and the mysteries of Freemasonry shall be safely lodged in the repository of faithful breast. Worshipful Master, Brother Senior Deacon, I have the pleasure of presenting the brothers who has made an advance emblematically through a porch, up a flight of winding stairs, consisting of three, five, 
and even seven steps through an outer and inner door into a place representing the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple and now awaits your pleasure. My brother, I congratulate you on arriving at a place representing the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple. It was there our ancient brethren had their names recorded as faithful workmen. It is here that you are entitled to have yours recorded as such. It was there our ancient brethren received their wages consisting of corn, wine, and oil, emblematical of nourishment, refreshment, and joy, which was to signify that our ancient brethren, when passed to this degree, were entitled to wages sufficient to procure not only the necessaries and comforts of life, but many of its superfluities. And may your industrious habits and strict application to business procure for you a plenty of the corn of nourishment, the wine of refreshment, and the oil of joy. The letter G, to which your attention was directed on your passage hither, has a still greater and more significant meaning. It is the initial of the grand and sacred name of God, before whom all masons, from the youngest and to the apprentice, who stands in the northeast corner of the lodge, to the worshipful master, who presides in the east, should most humbly, reverently, and devoutly bow. My brothers, this concludes the ceremonies of this degree. <laughs>